Amen. Now, we are going to discuss first Epistle of John, chapter 3, and verse 18, which says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. What does that verse mean? In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul was praying that we would be strengthened with might to the end that we might comprehend, he says in verse 18, what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Comprehend the breadth, length, depth, and height. In other words, there is dimensions to comprehension. You can comprehend, comprehend on various levels. In Hebrews 5 verse 13 and 14, it talks about the milk of the word and the meat of the word. So let's discuss this verse and let us... And I'm going to share it with you on, 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 on three different levels of understanding or revelation, so to speak. Level one. Um, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed. The Amplified says, let us not love merely in theory or in speech, but in deed and in truth, in practice and in sincerity. So it is talking, uh, let not our love be just some mere theoretical thing. Let it not just be talk. Let it be action. Let it be demonstrated. demonstrated. Let it be with sincerity, not with hypocrisy. Let love be, be, be with sincerity. And then it talks in the last part, in, in deed and in truth. We'll come back to that. But let your love be sincere, genuine. Now, just to pick up on that word, let it not be hypocritical. Or, or not in hypocrisy, Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be sincere. Let it be the real thing. And let it be sincere. And then it goes on to say, Be kindly affectionate one towards another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, in honor preferring one another. Now, as it says in honor, preferring one another. That means giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Um, and the Amplified, the Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, and I'm actually talking about a second level of meaning. So the first level of meaning is simply love with sincerity and not hypocrisy. But here we are seeing preferring one another. Philippians chapter 2 um, reading verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Esteeming each other better than themselves. The Amplified says, Let us regard the others as better and superior, superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of yourself. Now, this very issue of preferring one another, where I am, I mean, I don't take the, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, you take a, you know, you divide some food or you divide a sandwich, but you keep the bigger piece for yourself. No, preferring one another, preferring one another. In other words, letting self take the back seat. So it says, let us love from that perspective, where self is not what, is not what predominant, but self takes a back seat. Um, and, this, this, uh, and here in Philippians 2 verse 3, it's going to go on and talk about the mind of Christ. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, let each of us esteem and look upon, look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, not just about myself, but also for each other, for each and for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That was the kind of mind that was in Christ. That is why he laid down his life. This is the mind of Christ. So it is saying then, let us love from this place of having the, the mindset of Christ. Now, just to get some further insight into that, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, gives us a little bit of light and understanding of what is this mind of Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1, 1 Peter says, For as much then... As Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself 
likewise with the same mind. You've got to arm yourself. You've got to make up your mind to do this because it doesn't come naturally. Because there's going to be a war against you to not operate from this perspective of being unselfish. So you've got to arm yourself with this mind of Christ or else you will just fall into, into selfishness. you just fall into where you've got to look out for number one or where you come first. So arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. That in other words, he that has stopped pleasing himself and stopped putting himself first, he that has stopped pleasing himself, the enemy cannot bring him into sin. And that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So now he's not living um, be, be, because of, of, of the motivation of others or, or, or of any selfish motivation, he is living for the will of God. And in the will of God, he blesses and he loves other people. And, and, and he puts other people first. Amen? But there is also this element of, of, um, of having the mind of Christ. And in the mind of Christ, Jesus was obedient even unto the, even unto the horrible death of the cross. He made himself like a servant. And he put himself, he said that my meat is to do the will of the Father. John 4, John 4, 34. So this second level is where your self takes a back seat and you are beginning to do whatever you do. You're doing it, you're doing it as unto the Lord, it says in Colossians 3, verse 23 and 24. And you're doing it because it's the will of God. You're doing it because this is what pleased God. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, and this is a marvelous passage of Scripture. In fact, if someone asks me, what does 1 John 3, 18 mean? And they said, I only, I only have one sentence to answer that question. I would say to them, 1 John 3, 18 is what is captured in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. And I would say to them, if you can find out what those verses mean and be a doers of those verses, you will automatically be walking in the love of God and functioning from the, from the truth that is in Christ. And which is to say, loving indeed and in truth. All right. But anyway, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15 says, he, for, for, for he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him. So what happened is that you're not living for yourself, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. Self has no rule, no reign. So that's the second level. Where first of all, we're talking about loving with sincerity. Secondly, we're talking about loving from a perspective where we're preferring one another and self begins to move to the back seat. But now self can so move to the back seat that self could almost literally cease to exist. That would be the third level. And that is what it's really talking about when it's talking about loving in, in deed and loving in truth. But just to get there, what do you mean where there is no self? Look at, John, look at Luke chapter 14. Uh, just, to, just to quote Jesus and listen to how Jesus um, would, have, would, have, would have addressed that. What do you mean by no self? Loving from a perspective where, where self has no voice, where self is not dictating. What do you mean? Jesus says in Luke chapter four, 14, reading from verse 26, if any man will come after me, he must hate his father and mother, which means that they must not come first, and wife and children, they must not come first, and brethren and sisters, they must not come first, and even his own life, his own life must also not come first. And if you don't do that, he cannot be my disciple. He cannot be like me. And then he says, whoever don't bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. So this place of no self is the place of the cross where, the cro where, where you are crucified, and it is no longer you that live, but it's Christ that liveth in you. Galatians 2.20, that's what it says. This is the reality of who we are as believers. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I, but it is Christ that liveth in me. And the reality of that is I am crucified, and the life I now have, it is the life of Christ. Now, so it's loving from that perspective where there is no self. Luke 14, 33 goes on to say, So likewise, whosoever, whosoever he be of you that forsake not all that he had, he cannot be my disciple. That's really, I mean, as if, you know, there is no selfish agenda. Now, to operate in that place is to really operate in the place where 
where, and I'm calling this the third level of understanding, where it is the very life of Christ that has taken you over and it's the life of Christ that is flowing out of you. It is, it is the life of Christ that is functioning through you. First John 4, 17 says that here, here, is, here is how the love of God is perfect. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So I am not living as me, but I have yielded myself to him, and I'm acknowledging that the life I now live is the life of Christ, and it's his life emanating through me. So it's him loving through me. Colossians 3, and in that there is the reality of the fact that I am crucified with him. Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4 says, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So it says, the very life I have now is the life of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 says, all things are of God. And um, so to, to function in this, and you see the Bible says, God is love. Faith worked by love. So faith worked by God. It's Christ it in, is in me. He is the love shared abroad in my heart. Love is not just a thing. Love is a person. So when that person of Christ begins to shine through and operate through me, and I yield to him, and I acknowledge him, and I submit to that life, then I'm operating in this third level of understanding of this verse of Scripture, where I'm loving in, sincer in sincerity, I'm preferring one another, be preferring one another, and I'm operating from out of the life of Christ. All right. Look at how Jesus puts it. Let's go back to the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 16. First Epistle John chapter 3, verse 18, which is the verse we're studying. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If we back up to verse 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, if you're going to lay down your life for your brethren, you can only do that, if it means physically dying, you can only do that once. And that would be the last person you'll be able to demonstrate your love to. So it's more than that. In, in John chapter 15, and um, I believe it's, and it's verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love had no man than this, than a man should lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus says, here is what great love looks like. When you lay down your life for your friends, which means what? self is dethroned, self doesn't exist, self is crucified, and now it is the very person of Christ that is flowing through you. Amen? So, this is, the, this is, the, this is, the, is really where we, we go, we talk, what we're talking about in this verse. And at this point, when it's the life of Christ, and when it is him taking you over, and when self has no voice, you are loving in truth. Go back again to verse 18. But indeed and in truth, not just with truth, but in truth. But what is truth? Functioning in truth. F to function in truth, Jesus is the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. The truth is a person. Love is a person. So to function in truth is to function in Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 uh, and verse 21, you can look it up, but it says that the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in him. So it's functioning from that place. Functioning in him. And the truth is also God's perspective, the way God sees it. Many times we look on the horizontal and we judge things and we say this is true. This is a fact. That is a fact. That's not how God sees it. The way God, God's perspective is God sees it according to his word. God, and the Bible says his word is forever settled in heaven. Psalms 119 verse 8 and 9. So the issue of truth is also God's perspective. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 says, The knowledge of the Holy One. That is, the knowledge that the Holy One has. The, the knowledge of the Holy One means from His perspective. Truth. So we're talking about loving in truth from God's perspective. Now what is God's perspective? That person that might be annoying you, that might be irritating you, that person that might not be very nice and kind and, and, and might not be very lovable, God says that he played their sins on Jesus. God says that Jesus paid the price for their sins. And God says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16 that he is, verse 17, that their sins and the iniquities, he's not remembering them anymore. 
God says be there a believer, they might not be walking right, they might be immature, they might be dominated by the flesh, they might be carnal. But God says in Colossians 1 and verse 22 that he sees them as holy and blameless and without reproof. Because he sees them after the Spirit. He sees them through the blood of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 and 19 says that God was in, that we have got a ministry of reconciliation whereby we are to declare unto the world, even to that sinner person that is not born again, that God was in Christ reconciling him unto himself and is not holding his sins and trespasses against him. So if you are going to love from God's perspective, if you are going to love from being in Christ, then you are going to have to be able to forgive the way God forgives. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 32, 4 verse 32, that we forgive even as God in Christ has forgiven us. God forgives you before you confess your sins. When you for confess your sins, that's when you receive your forgiveness. That's when you get liber liberated from the sense of condemnation and insecurity and, and, and broken fellowship. But God forgave you 2,000 years ago. And he's not holding his sins and trespasses against you. But of course, if you miss it, the devil will accuse you. And so as the so as to chop off the devil's access of accusation against you, you may need to confess his sins. And he's faithful and does to forgive you. But ultimately, God was in Christ reconciling you and every person unto himself. So when we forgive, according to Ephesians 4 verse, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, he, that we are forgiven according to the riches of his grace. Not according to how much we plead and beg and how, how much we fast and how many tears we cry. Well, that means we got to forgive people the same way. Not because they said they're sorry. Whether they say they're sorry or they don't say they're sorry, we still forgive them. Jesus even put it this way. First of all, we need to understand that we are ambassadors. And as ambassadors, we don't have our own message. We have the message of the kingdom. We are speaking on, behalf, on his behalf. And the Bible says in in um, Revelation 5 verse 10, Revelation 1 verse 6, that we are now kings and priests unto God. And as a priest under the high priest of Christ, I am preaching his message. What is his message? He's saying to people, neither do I condemn thee. Because your sins, because the blood has been shed, the price has been paid. God has already ransomed you. So... Jesus therefore said in John 20 verse 23, if we would dare to believe it, he says, whatever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whatever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. So we go to that person that is all laden with sin and condemnation and we let them know that your sin has already been judged in the body of Christ and the wrath for it was already poured out and God has reconciled you and therefore I just declare unto you through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and I say I remit your sins. You say, well, oh, how can I do that? Well, according to, remember I said 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 16 is the ultimate answer to this question as to how do we, how do we love indeed and in truth when you look at it on, a, on an accurate, somewhat higher level. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, this love of Christ, the way God sees it, his love constrains me, it controls me, it dominates me, it so possesses me that I judge that if that one man Jesus died for all, then they were all dead. That means I'm dead, they're dead, we are all buried with him in baptism unto death. We all died in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 12. And when I judge someone that way, and I judge them dead in Christ, I can't hold his trespasses against them. When I judge that I have been crucified and there's no longer any self, then I'm liberated from frustration. When I, when I see that they are dead, and I, I, then what happens is I'm at a place where, I, I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't have any expectation. They can't disappoint me. They can, I mean, there is no, I mean, if they don't say thanks, I don't get upset. I don't get offended. I'm crucified. They're crucified. And so it says, now that I live, I live unto him. And because of this whole new perspective, because of the finished work of the cross, verse 16 says that from here on, I don't know any man whatsoever, believer or unbeliever, I don't know any man after the flesh. Which means I don't see and know any man from a mere human standpoint. I see them through the blood. I see them through the cross. So, and, but to be in, uh, and, and this place of operating from in Christ, this is the place where understanding and revelation comes from. This is the place where truth operates. But to be in that place, it takes humility. Because why? Naturally, before we, as we mature, 
starting out, we are very opinionated people. We are very argumentative. But the Word of God says that if you want to be in this place where God would give you revelation knowledge, Psalms 25 verse 9 says, it's the meek that he will teach his way. Psalms 138 verse 2 says, you've got to magnify his word above all else. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, let God be true in every man which includes me, be a liar. And then he, uh, it also goes on to say that God resists the proud. God who knows the proud are far off. So I have to be in this place of humility where I'm submitting to the word of God, where I'm open and I'm teachable. And Proverbs 3, 5 to 7 says, I acknowledge him. I recognize he is God. I recognize he is first. I put away my own opinions and I put myself in a place where I'm not wise in my own eyes and I fear the Lord. Isaiah eleven three says, now when I'm in that place, in the fear of the Lord, in that place I will be of quick understanding. So that's really is what I, what I see. And, um, but it's not, you know, and many times, you know, as people are argumentative and so on, what do you do? 2 Timothy 2 verse 23 to 26 says, first of all, that we are to avoid foolish questions about genealogies and questions that are only going to lead to strife. When somebody will have a question and it's just about just to get an argument to prove who's right, they're not in a place to learn. But and in fact, it even, says in, it, it even says to avoid that type of argument. It even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse, verse 38, let the ignorant be ignorant still. But when somebody is sincere and they want to know the truth and they're humble, God says he will reveal to them. Amen? So that is really how it is. Hallelujah. So blessed be the name of the Lord God forevermore. So bottom line what it is, to love God, to love one another with sincerity, to love one another, prefer one another, and even come to the place where it is not just you, but it's Christ in you that is loving them. And where you are operating from a place of truth, operating from who you are in Christ, and who you are in Christ, there is no self, the old man is crucified, and Jesus reigns. And you see everybody through the eyes of Jesus, through the blood of Christ, you remit people's sins, and you forgive even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Blessed be the name of the Lord.